study group here in Pensacola, Florida. Tonight we're going to be bringing you part two of the three-part series, The Lineage of Adam to Noah and His Three Sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Part two, Ham and His Descendants. Let us begin. Let us begin tonight's lesson with scriptures taken from the book of Acts, chapter 21, verses 37 and 38. Here we're going to read about a very, very telling account where the apostle Shaul, Shaul, not Paul, always remember that uh, they always change the names of the people. They change the names of the places into something Greek or Latin. So be always be aware of that. Uh, when you're studying scriptures. So here we have the apostle Shaul, known as Paul, being taken into prison. And uh, because the uh, Hebrews were angry at him because they thought that he was teaching uh, others to disobey the law. They thought that he had brought Gentiles into the uh, temple, which was forbidden. And in order to prevent them from killing the apostle Paul or Shaul, they uh, took him into custody for his own safekeeping. So this is where we are when we pick up on Acts 21, verse 37 and 38. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian which before these days made an uproar? Here we have this very so telling account of where this descendant of Japheth, this descendant of Japheth was surprised that the this Hebrew Israelite um, uh, could speak Greek. So he responded, so Paul obviously responded to him in Greek, and the chief captain is shocked. Canst thou speak Greek? Being that thou art an Egyptian, he thought that the apostle Paul was an Egyptian. Egyptians are descendants from Ham. Ham, the progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negro. Now you tell me, why would this chief captain think that the apostle Shaul was an Egyptian? Surprised that he spoke Greek. Surprised that he spoke Greek. If it weren't because he looked like an Egyptian and Egyptians <laughs> look like uh, other dark-skinned people. He thought that he was an Egyptian. He thought he was a descendant of Ham. So we're going to touch on this again a little bit later on. Next, we're going to have a, uh, a recap, a real quick recap of the genealogy of Adam. And uh, we're going to take a look at uh, Ham, the progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negroes. Again, this is going to be a recap. Very quickly, we're going to do this because we're going to spend more, most of our time here in looking at Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Here we have Shem, Ham, and Japheth when they divided the earth 
after the flood amongst themselves and they took an oath and here we're going to find out why Canaan was cursed why Canaan was cursed not Ham but Canaan we're going to find out why Canaan was cursed and it was not Ham and it had nothing to do with a lot of these filthy explanations that a lot of these more racist uh, descendants of Japheth have come up with and unfortunately many of our own people have uh, continued this filth and this lie in our missed teachings being is that most of the teachings that we find that we have in the Christian church is coming from those who taught us and who was it that taught us this stuff Japheth The genealogy from Adam to Noah. Now this is going to be a, a very quick recap of part one where we covered this material in detail. So if you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to go back to part one and watch that in, uh, uh, in its focus on Japheth. And there you get much more of the detail, which we're not going to repeat here. So let's begin on this. On this uh, slide here we have Adam and Kawa or Eve as we learned her name was Kawa not Eve Adam and Kawa as we all know had Cain and Abel we know that Cain killed Abel but what most of us don't know is that Adam and Kawa had a daughter named Awan Awan A-W-A-N we find Awan in the book of Jubilee which the uh, Gentiles have decided not to uh, consider scriptures amongst themselves, although they have no right to decide what is and is not scripture, since the scriptures was not even given to them, nor written by them. So we have Awan. Awan. Awan be, uh, became the wife of Cain. Now remember that this is the beginning of mankind. So there were no other options but to join with one's brother and sister to uh, propagate the, the human family. So Cain and Awan joined together and they had children. Then there was Seth. Seth uh, uh, joined with his sister Azura, A-Z-U-R-A. -A. Azura was the wife of her brother Seth and they had children together and then there was a third daughter which we find in the book of Jasher or Yashur chapter 1 verse 12 and then in Jubilees chapter 4 verse 10 through 14 we find that there were nine more sons nine more sons for a total of 15 children and we're going to focus on the the lineage of Seth of Seth we see the Seth fathered Enos Enos fathered Canaan Canaan fathered Mahalalel Mahalalel fathered Jared now it was during the time of Jared as described in Genesis chapter 6 where the sons of Yah these angels looked upon the daughters of men and found them as the King James Bible describes it as being fair but that is not the correct interpretation the interpretation should be beautiful or desirable not fair which clearly implies a, uh, a type of skin texture you know there was nothing fair about these women or these people so when it says that the sons of God looked upon the daughters of men and found them fair understand that, that word in the Hebrew is is tob which should be uh, which means beautiful or desirable here we have Jared fathering Enoch Enoch was the man who was righteous in the eyes of Yah he was so righteous that holy Yah decided that Enoch would not experience death 
And it's, the scripture says that he took Enoch. He took him. He did not allow Enoch to experience death. Enoch is the man who wrote the book of Enoch. Enoch fathered Methuselah. Methuselah fathered Lamech. Lamech and his woman Betanos parented Noah. Noah is described in the book of Enoch, chapter 106, as the first white child born to mankind. The first white child born to mankind, which clearly implies that everyone before Noah were dark skinned, or what we would call today black people. Here we begin with Noah and his woman, M. Zara. From previous discussion, we know that Noah was the first white child born to mankind, according to the book of Enoch, chapter 106. Here we have Noah joining with his woman, M. Zara, M. Zara, from Jubilee, chapter 4, verse 33. They have three children. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Japheth we've already taken a look at. We have concluded that Japheth was either born white like his father or he was dark skinned like his mother and his descendants at some point turned white. Yes, they either turned white and we showed a video where black people do turn white. It is known to happen. So now we're going to focus on Ham. Well, again, when we turn to the Zondervan Compact Bible Dictionary and we look up the definition of Ham, we read the following. The youngest son of Noah, born probably about 96 years before the flood and one of eight persons to live through the flood. He became the progenitor of the dark races not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, and Canaanites. So Ham was the progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negro. So that means that there is another source or another lineage for these so-called Negroes. And as we should all know, those who are labeled Negroes were those people who were brought over here in these slave ships during the transatlantic slave trade. So those so-called Negroes, those dark-skinned Negroes, uh, had a different progenitor than Ham. But it says here that Ham was the progenitor of the Egyptian, those dark-skinned Egyptians. Now, I want you to go back to our scripture reading where we looked at uh, Acts chapter 21, verses 37 and 38, where the descendant of Japheth, a Roman, mistook the apostle Shaul for an Egyptian. An Egyptian. The Egyptians are descended from Ham. The Egyptians are dark skinned, which we would call today black. Now, why would this, why would this uh, Roman chief captain mistake the apostle Paul, Shaul, as a Hamitic Egyptian? Because he was dark skinned, just like the Hamitic Egyptians. That's why. But Christianity never brings this out, do they? They've never made a point of showing us this, have they? Then we have the Ethiopians, which we know are dark-skinned people, and the Libyans, who are also really dark-skinned people. And not to be confused with these Arabs that occupy the northern part of Africa today. The original people were dark-skinned Hamitic people.
Now we're going to cover the descendants of Ham, the father or progenitor of the dark races, but not the Negroes. This information is going to come from Genesis chapter 10, verses 6 through 20, where it describes the descendants of Ham. And we're going to combine this with information from the book of Jubilee, chapter 7, verse 15. So here we find the progenitor of the dark races, Ham, with his woman. Now, I know I'm going to butcher this name, but, uh, I mean, bear with me. Her name is Ni'ila Tamauk. Ni'ila Tamauk. I mean, when you just pronounce this name, you know this was no white woman. Ain't no white woman named Ni'ila Tamauk. These were Hamites. These are descendants of Ham. What we would call today Africans. It even sounds African. The Eli Tamauk, or even um, what we would call, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, Indian in there. But here we have Ham and his woman, the Eli Tamauk, and they had four sons Cush, Mizraim, Canaan, and Foot. Cush, Mizraim, Canaan, and Foot. Now we know that uh, Cush. Uh, was the father of the Ethiopian, the Sudanese, the Babylonians, and Seba, Havila, Sapta, Rama, Sheba, Don, Sheba, Didan, Sabteka, and Nimrod. Nimrod. Nimrod was a descendant of Ham. So when you're reading Nimrod in the Bible, you should be picturing another dark-skinned man in our holy scriptures. We've always been there. The, Jew, the European has just written us out. The descendants of Japheth have just written the, the descendants of Ham out of the scriptures in most cases and attempted to replace the, uh, the Shemites. But that's another story. So, but we see clearly here that Nimrod is a descendant of Cush, who was a descendant of Ham, the father of the dark races. So if Ham was dark-skinned, Cush was dark-skinned, and Nimrod was dark-skinned. Now I want you to notice that in scriptures, it does not point these people out. It does not distinguish these people out as being different from everybody else as it did Noah in the uh, book of uh, Enoch, chapter 106, where it described him as being different from everybody else. All right, but here we have no such uh, uh, description indicating to us that they looked like everybody else. So then we move over to Mizraim, the son Mizraim. Mizraim is the Hebrew name for those who we call Egyptians. But we should know that the word Egyptian is not, quote unquote, African. Even African is not even African for that matter. But uh, Egyptian is taken from the Greek. These people called themselves Kemet. The Hebrews called them Mizraim. And here you see the descendants of a Mizraim. I'm not going to read these. You see them. You can then we have the son Canaan, the child Canaan, who saw his father, uh, who, who, who was uh, uh, cursed by his grandfather, Noah. And you see his descendants, Sidon, Eth, Hit, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, Gergesites, Hivites, Archites, Sinites, Arvadites. Zemorites and Hamathites. And then we see the uh, son Foot or Put, who are described as the Libyans. All these boys are the descendants of their father and their mother, Ham and Nila Atamauk. Now, as we learned in part one, 
uh, the book of Genesis chapter 10 describes the descendants of Japheth as the original Gentiles. But here we see um, the, the, the others who were Hamites who later on were added to that group undeniably uh, because of their behavior, because of what they did. They got added to that little group over there with Japheth as uh, uh, Gentiles, they got added in, they were reckoned as Gentiles. We see and verify this in the first Ezra chapter eight, verses 68 through 70, which reads, now when these were done, the rulers came unto me and said, the nation of Israel, the princes and the priests and Levites have not put away from them the strange people of the land, nor the pollutions of the Gentiles, to wit, or that is, of the Canaanites, Hittites, Pharisites, Jebusites, and the Moabites, Egyptians, and the Edomites. For both they and their sons have married with their daughters, and the holy seed is mixed with the strange people of the land. And from the beginning of this matter, the rulers and the great men have been partakers of this iniquity. So here we have in the first, uh, in first Esdras, where these other groups are now considered uh, Gentiles. They are reckoned with the Gentiles of Japheth, the Canaanites, here, the, the, see, the descendants of Canaan. These are the ones who we have uh, highlighted in red. Canaanites and the Hittites and the Pharisites and the Jebusites. Those are all Hamites. But note that when we get to the Moabites, the Moabites are not Hamites. The Moabites are descendants of Shem. They are a result of the daughters of Lot having sex with their father. And having the one who was the oldest child who had the oldest daughter who had the son called, called Moab. And the younger daughter had the son called Ammon. But these are Shemites. So here we see clearly we've got the Hamites and we have the Shemites being added to that happy little basket of, of uh, Gentiles. And then we have the Egyptians who are... Uh, you know, who the apostle Paul was mistaken for. He is the, he was mistaken for a Hamite, a dark skinned Hamite. And then we have the Edomites. Well, the Edomites are descendants of Shem also. They are also Hebrews. The Edomites are descendants of Esau, the brother of Jacob. Their parents were Shemites, obviously. They were Hebrews, obviously. But the Edomites were not Israelites. They were Hebrew, but they were not Israelites. So here we see again another descendant of, the, of Shemites and Hebrews being added to that happy little basket of people called Gentiles. Here we see a map of the distribution of the descendants of Ham and Japheth. Now we've already covered Japheth, but look to the north of that area called the Mediterranean Sea. Tarshish and Tyrus and Kittim, Javan, Dudanim. These are all those Gentiles, the descendants of Japheth, which we've already covered. But we want you to also take a look at the northeast side of the Mediterranean, where you have the Archivites. Semites, the Arvadites, the Zamorites, the Hamathites, and Zidon. These are all Hamites. 
Hamites. These are all these dark-skinned Hamites. So were we in that area to the west or to the east of the Mediterranean? Absolutely. Was not Nimrod a descendant of Ham? Yes, he was. And he was from this area. Again, showing you the reality that in time past, these areas were occupied by the dark-skinned Hamites. Look at look to the uh, where we would normally see Israel. Long before the Israel, it was Israel. It was part of Canaan land. Canaan, the Hamite, Canaan again, dark-skinned people, and the Jebusites and Heath and Amorites, Girgashites, and all of them are listed here in that area which today these people erroneously call the Middle East. They created that area called uh, that term the Middle East after they stole it from the rightful uh, inhabitants and they came in and they claimed it and with uh, intermixing with these people. Remember the scripture talked about that they were that they uh, that they had mixed the holy seed. Well, that mixture took place with everybody. Notice the Canaan, Canaan, occupied by the Jebusites, Heath, Amorites, Gergesites, Hivites, and Dedan, all up and down that area today, which we would think of as Arab. But long, but the Arab is a is a combination of people. They were not one of the original peoples of 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 Noah. You know, they were the they were a mixture of Shemites and Hamites mainly. And then later on, you got Japheth got into it. All right. Now we look over here and we see Mizraim, Mizraim, and all of those other descendants of Ham down through Mizraim, and there's put to the south of the Mediterranean. All right. So here we have a clearly showing the reality, what was at the time. All of these dark-skinned people occupying the area today, they call Saudi Arabia. Now we're going to address what has become known as the Hamitic curse. The Hamitic curse. This is where uh, supposedly Ham and his descendants were cursed because of Ham uh, coming into the tents of his father Noah and seeing his father Noah's nakedness. And by the account of some of these really sick racists out here, they even claim that uh, what really took place was that Noah, or that Ham had sex with his father Noah. I mean, imagine that. I mean, so let's investigate this. Uh, uh, um, let's investigate this and let's take a look and see if the scripture says anything about uh, Ham and his descendant, Ham having sex with his with his father uh and i've even uh, read and studied some accounts where they claim that he had sex with his mother but let's see by the king james version of that scripture let's see what it says does it say anything about him having sex with his father does it say anything about him having sex with his mother let's take a look uh we're in genesis chapter 9 verses 18 through 27. And the sons of Noah that went forth of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward 
and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what the younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the God, the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Now, it's really amazing because even during the times of slavery in the Americas, uh, uh, Christianity, the, the leaders of Christianity justified uh, the enslavement of the so-called African people who we know were really, uh, for the most part, Hebrew Israelites. Uh, it, this, they used this to justify uh, the enslavement. They used this to justify, not only justify the enslavement of the dark-skinned people uh, of uh, the Hebrew Israelites and the Africans, but to even besmear their, their character and their spirit by claiming that he had sex with his mother. Okay, but did we read anywhere in here where he said he had sex with mom or dad? He didn't say anything of the sort. Verse 22 says, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. He saw the nakedness of his father. Verse 23 says, And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backwards, and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backwards, and they saw not their father's nakedness. So the issue here is seeing their father's nakedness. Ham surely did see his father's nakedness. And where he was at fault was not simply just getting a garment or a blanket and going in and covering his father, uh, and, and, and let that be the end of it. But beyond that, you can't blame Ham for what his father did. Ham didn't get drunk. His father got drunk. Ham didn't cause his father's clothes to come undone. Uh, that was Noah. Noah did that. So how can you blame Ham for what his father did? Nor did it say anything whatsoever about his mother. It said that Ham saw. Now, where these people with these demon spirits are getting this garbage from is when they uh, inappropriately use Leviticus 18, 6 and, and 7, where it says in the law, none of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. Verse 7, the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Well, these demons out here, <laughs> a lot of them, these white races uh, masquerading around as Christians, but yet, on another hand, maybe it's not so much of a masquerade. Maybe that's what Christianity actually is. All right, but they are the ones who promote in this garbage about having sex <clears throat> with their mother. Uh, the scripture doesn't even say that the mother was even in the tent. And if we look at the uh, verses here in Leviticus 18, 6 and 18, 7, it says that they should not uncover the nakedness of their father or their mother. In this particular case, Ham did not uncover the nakedness of his father. His father uncovered himself some kind of way, either by not strapping his garments down correctly or in his drunken stupor, he fell down or something happened where his, his garments came loose. But you cannot blame that on, on Ham. That's not Ham's fault. That's his father's fault getting drunk. It's even his father's fault uh, 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 that he saw him naked. Because he had he, had he had he not been naked, 
if he had not gotten drunk, he would have even seen him naked. Now, while we're here on this, notice that it says in verse 25, it says, and he, Noah said, cursed be Canaan, cursed be Canaan, and a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Who did he curse? Canaan. He didn't curse Ham. He cursed Canaan. Canaan is the, the son, one of the sons of Ham. Noah cursed his grandson. The question then becomes, well, why would you cur curse your grandson? Your grandson wasn't even there. According to the information that we have here in Genesis 9, there's no indication that his grandson was even on the scene. And the reason why he cursed Noah uh, or, or Noah cursed Canaan had nothing to do directly with Ham seeing his nakedness. But what was really taking place was that it's a prophecy of what was going to happen, that Canaan would be cursed. And we're going to go into this a little later uh, as we progress onward. But it wasn't Ham that was cursed. So this lie that these demons have been telling that about uh, African slavery is justified uh, because it says that a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. No, it doesn't say that. It says, cursed be Canaan. Canaan, a servant of servants, not Ham, not all the Hamitic people. Just more lies that have never gotten corrected. As, as old as I am, I have never been in any Christian church service where they have tackled this problem or any Bible study. But that's the reason why we started our own Bible study. So we can know the truth. So that the truth can make us free. Let's go on. Now that we've read uh, about the curse of Canaan uh, from the King James uh, version of the Bible, which is translated from the Masoretic text, which I hope you realize has some very significant errors in it very significant errors in it, which uh, we'll address at a later time. Uh, which one brother out here on that I'll direct you to is, uh, what's his name, Brother uh, uh, Yehuda Israel. He does a wonderful job on dealing with some of these errors that are in the Masoretic text. But let's compare that same subject matter of Noah being in his tent and getting drunk from another source. Let's take a look at what the Book of Jubilees has to say about that same uh, event. And book, so we'll be reading from the Book of Jubilees, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. And let's see if it says anything about having sex with his father or having sex with his mom or anything like that. Okay, here we go. Uh, chapter 7 from the Book of Jubilees, verses 1 through 8. And in the seventh year... In the first year thereof, in this jubilee, Noah planted vines on the mountain on which the ark had rested, named Lubar, one of the Ararat mountains. And they produced forth, and they produced fruit in the fourth year. And he guarded their fruit and gathered it in this year, in the seventh month. And he made wine therefrom and put it into a vessel and kept it until the fifth year, until the first day on the new moon of the first month. And he celebrated with joy the day of this feast. And he made a burnt offering unto the Lord, one young ox, one ram, seven sheep, each a year old and a kid of the goats that he might make atonement thereby for himself and his sons he prepared the kid first and placed some of his blood on the flesh that was on the altar which he had made and all the fat he laid on the altar where he had made the burnt off the burnt sacrifice and the ox and the ram 
and the sheep. And he laid all their flesh upon the altar and he placed all their offerings mingled with oil upon it. And afterwards he sprinkled wine on the fire, which he had previously made on the altar. He placed incense on the altar and called a sweet savor to ascend acceptable before the Lord his God, Yah, and he replay and he rejoiced and drank of this wine, he and his children with joy. And it was evening, and he went into his tent, and being drunken, he lay down and slept, and was uncovered in his tent as he slept. And Ham saw Noah, his father, naked. Okay, so again, no mention of mom in the tent. In this scenario, it sounds like all of them were outside around the, the campfire, uh, uh, enjoying themselves drinking wine. What did verse 6 say? And he rejoiced and drank of this wine, he and his children, with joy. So all of them apparently were out there. Uh, uh, drinking the wine and, you know, and having a good time. Then he decided, you know, I'm feeling a little, a little top to turvy here. I think I'm going to go lay down for a while. So he goes into his tent. It says that he lay down and uh, it said, and was uncovered in his tent as he slept. Now, he didn't say somebody uncovered him. It just said that he became uncovered or was uncovered. Doesn't say a thing about mom being in there. Doesn't say a thing about anybody having sex with him while he was asleep. Let's go on. Now, continuing on chapter 7, verses 9 through 15 of the book of Jubilees. And went forth and told his two brethren without, that would be uh, Ham, going forth and telling his two brothers without. And Shem took his garment and arose, he and Japheth. And they placed the garment on their shoulders and went backward and covered the shame of their father. And their faces were backwards. And Noah awoke from his sleep and knew all that his younger son had done unto him. And he cursed his son and said, Cursed be Canaan, and enslaved servant shall he be unto his brethren. And he blessed Shem, and said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and God, Yah, shall dwell in the dwellings of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Ham knew that his father had cursed his younger son. And he was displeased that he had cursed his son. And he parted from his father, he and his sons with him. Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And he built for himself a city and called its name after the name of his wife, Na'elot Tamauk. And Japheth saw it and became envious of his brother. Okay, so by this account uh, from the Book of Jubilees, again, there's no indication whatsoever about uh, uh, somebody of one of Noah uh, uh, being sodomized uh, by his son uh, Ham. It doesn't say that whatsoever. There's nothing in here that says anything about mom being in the tent and and uh, Ham having sex with his mother. There's nothing like this. It's nothing but the filthy, degenerate minds that uh, these wicked people had to come up with to try to cover their own wickedness. Again, the only thing that you can really find at fault with for uh, Ham 
is that Ham didn't just simply cover up his father's nakedness and and leave and and let it be done with that. No, he wasn't. And he uh, uh, he told his his brothers uh, Shem and Japheth, and they covered their father's nakedness. But again, it says nothing whatsoever, nothing whatsoever about Ham having sex with his father or his mother. But notice something. Notice something in verse 15. Let me back, in verse, let me back up to 14. And it says, his father, he and his sons with him. You're talking about um, Ham, Ham, the father, and his sons with him, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And he built for himself a city and called its name after the name of his wife. Now, Eli Tamauk, this is the wife of Ham, right? This is the wife of Ham, okay? But notice what it says directly thereafter. And Japheth saw it and became envious of his brother. Japheth, here we go, Japheth, that the progenitor of the uh, Gentiles, Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, right? The group of people who are immediately in scriptures identified as being the Gentiles, right? Take a look at it. Genesis chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. All right. So this is very suspicious by itself. And Japheth saw it and became jealous of his brother. Uh, I think Japheth is always jealous of, of what somebody else has. That's why Japheth and his descendants are always stealing and killing and lying to, to gain the, the, the resources of somebody else's land. And we're going to see that this is still, this is tied into scriptures. This is very scriptural. What we see going on in the world today, Japheth, the same one who dropped the atomic bombs, the same one who colonized half the world, the same one who's picking a war with Russia and China, Japheth. That's him. Make no mistake about it. That's Japheth. All of Japheth. That all of Japheth? No. The leadership of Japheth, yeah. But the but the ordinary people under Japheth are going along with it for the most part. Let's go on. Now we're going to pick up in Jubilees chapter 8. And this is a bit of departure from what we were talking about, yet connected. So pay attention to what's going on here. This is where the sons of Noah divide the earth amongst themselves. And in here, we're going to see some reasons. Uh, some inf we're going to get some information that's going to explain to us, so give us some insight onto why Japheth became uh, envious of, of, of Ham. And we're going to get some insight onto why, on the real reason, Canaan was cursed. Canaan wasn't even in the tent, remember? There's, there's no indication that Canaan was even in the tent. So the question becomes, why would, would uh, Noah curse his grandson when his grandson wasn't even there? Because in reality, it has nothing to do with it. This this is a this is this is a prophetic verse that's getting ready that's telling you about something that's going to happen in the future. Yes, Canaan is going to be be cursed, but it ain't got nothing to do with his father seeing his father naked. It certainly has nothing to do with uh, uh, his uh, his father uh, Ham having sex with his dad or his mom. So let's go into this. We're going to take a look at Jubilees chapter eight. We're going to start with verse 7 and down through 11. And she, Muak, from Jubilee 8, verse 6, bare him a son in the fifth year thereof, and he called his name Eber. Now, we should know again, or if you don't know, go back and review uh, chapter 10. The Eber was a descendant of Shem. So what we're reading here 
is picking up with the lineage of Shem. But it is directly connected into Ham. That's why we have it here. Okay, so she, Muak, bear Shem a son in the fifth year thereof, and um, he called his name Eber. And he took unto him a wife, and he called her name Azurad, the daughter of Nebrod, in the 32nd Jubilee, in the seventh week, in the third year thereof. And in the sixth year thereof, she bare him son, and he called his name Peleg. For in the days when he was born, the children of Noah began to divide the earth amongst themselves. For this reason, he called his name Peleg, and they divided it secretly amongst themselves and told it to Noah. And it came to pass in the beginning of the 33rd Jubilee that they divided the earth into three parts for Shem, Ham, and Japheth, according to the inheritance of each in the first year in the first week when one of us who had been sent was with them and he called his sons and drew nigh to him they and their children and he divided the earth into the lot which his three sons were to take in possession and they reached forth their hands and took the writing out of the bosom of Noah, their father. Okay, so here we have the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They have what's going on here is like a, a drawing. They're going to take drawings on who is going to take which part of earth. Remember, the earth has been destroyed with water. The flood has killed off everybody but these eight people, Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah, and their wives. All right, and then all the little animals on uh, that were on uh, the ark. So now they're dividing up the land, and this is so important, so very important. Let's go on. Now, before we continue here, let me just say that now I'm starting this color coding so that we can kind of keep uh, the inheritance and uh and to whom it goes uh in order here we're going to use this bluish color to indicate shem and his inheritance there's going to be a dark brown color that's going to be used for ham and for japheth we're going to stick with red okay all right all right so we're going to pick up here in the book of jubilees chapter 8 verses 12 and go through 18. Okay, here we go. And there came forth on the writing as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth, which he should take as an inheritance for himself and for his sons for the generations of eternity. And all that is towards the north is Japheth. And all that is towards the south belongs to Shem, and it extends till it reaches Carazo. This is in the bosom of the tongue, which looks towards the south, and his portion extends along the great sea, and it extends in a straight line till it reaches the, the west of the tongue, which looks towards the south. For this sea is named the tongue of of the Egyptian Sea. And it turns from here towards the south, towards the mouth of the Great Sea on the shore of its waters, and it extends to the west to Afra, and it extends till it reaches the waters of the river Gihon, and to the south of the waters of Gihon, to the banks of this river, and it extends toward the east till it reaches the garden Eden to the south thereof. And from the east of the whole land of Eden 
and of the whole east it turns to the east and proceeds till it reaches the east of the mountain named Rapha and it descends to the bank of the mouth of the river Tina or Tina this portion came forth by lot for Shem and his sons that they should possess it forever unto his generations forever and Noah rejoiced for this portion came forth for Shem and for his sons and he remembered all that he had spoken with his mouth in prophecy for he has said blessed be the Lord God of Shem and may the Lord dwell in the dwellings of Shem now very quickly let's go back so they, they're they, they're dividing up the the earth and this chapter is telling you what portion belongs to Shem Notice that it starts with Shem personally I believe the Shem was the firstborn then Ham then uh, Japheth all right so we have this area as described by scriptures now I and most of us have no clue or very little clue of these um, uh, landscapes all right but taking it for what it says you know this is the portion that was given to Shem let's go on Now, this is a continuation of the uh, inheritance that was uh, given to Shem by Lot. Uh, namely, as we saw earlier, that it was referred to as the middle, the middle of the earth. So here we are in chapter 8, verses 19 through 22. And he knew, that is, uh, Noah knew, and he knew that the Garden of Eden is the holy of holies and the dwelling of the lord and mount sinai the center of the desert and mount zion the center of the navel of the earth these three were created as holy places facing each other and he blessed the god of gods who had put the word of the lord into his mouth and the Lord forever more and he knew that a blessed portion and a blessing had come to Shem and his sons unto the generations forever the whole land of Eden and the whole land of the Red Sea and the whole land of the East and India and on the Red Sea and the mountains thereof and all the land of Bashan and all the land of Lebanon and the islands of Kaftur and all the mountains of Sanir and Ramana and the mountains of Ashur in the north and all the land of Elam Ashur and Babel and Susan and Madai, uh, Maria, and all the mountains of Arat, and all the region beyond the sea, which is beyond the mountains of Ashur towards the north, a blessed and spacious land, and all that is in it is very good. Now it sounds like Shem. <laughs> He got him a he got himself a very very uh, beautiful and wealthy uh, inheritance in the middle earth right in the middle earth he got the garden of Eden which is referred to as the holy of holies he got Mount Zion all these things were part of his inheritance by lot as these three children divided up earth amongst themselves next we're going to take a look at the inheritance for ham 
Ham, the middle son of Noah. Jubilees chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. And for Ham came forth the second portion beyond the Gihon towards the south to the right of the garden and it extends towards the south and it extends to all the mountains of fire and it extends towards the west of the sea of Atel and it extends towards the west till it reaches the sea of Mauk that sea into which everything which is not destroyed descends and it goes forth towards the north to the limits of Gadir and it goes forth to the coast of the waters of the sea to the waters of the great sea till it draws near to the river Gihon and goes along the river Gihon till it reaches the right of the garden of Eden and this is the land which came forth for Ham as the portion which he was to occupy forever for himself and his sons unto their generations forever. So here we see that uh, 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 the inheritance of Ham and again I don't know the landscape or the names of these ancient names that are being used here, but we can get the general picture by thinking of the, the center of the earth. And it appears that uh, from this is that Ham got the southern portion of the earth. So that only leaves uh, one other region. And that would be the region of the north that would be given unto Japheth. Let's see if that's the case. Does Japheth get the land to the north? Let's see. Okay, now we're going to be covering Japheth's inheritance. We're in the book of Jubilees, chapter 8, verses 25 through 30. Now, what I'd like you to do is pay close attention to how many times the word north appears. Pay attention to how many times the word north appears. And it can and you can see that the uh the, the, the children, the families of those who are referred to as the descendants of Japheth, those must be the people who we refer to today as the Europeans or so called white people. All right, to the north. Let's let's take a look at what it says in the book of Jubilees. Chapter 8, 25 through 30. Verse 25. And for Japheth came forth the third portion beyond the river Tina or Tina to the north of the outflow of its waters, and it extends north easterly to the whole region of Gog and to all the country east thereof and it extends northerly to the north and it extends to the mountains of Celt towards the north and towards the sea of Mauk and it goes forth to the east of Gadir as far as the region of the waters of the sea and it extends until it approaches the west of Farah and it returns towards Afareg, and it extends easterly to the waters of the sea of Miat, and it extends to the region of the river Tina or Tina in a northeasterly direction until it approaches the boundary of its waters towards the mountains Rafa, and it turns round towards the north. This is the land which came forth for Japheth and his sons as the portion of his inheritance, which he should possess for himself and his sons for their generations forever. Five great islands and a great land in the north, but it is cold and the land of Ham is hot. 
in the land of Shem is neither hot nor cold, but it is a blend of cold and heat. Now, if this doesn't describe the European people, the people we know as Europeans, uh, Europe actually being a non-existent continent, it's a name, it's a concept that they gave, but it's really on the, uh, the Asian continent. It's in Southwest Asia. All right. But they, as usual, rename something and put something on there. And I notice that these, this, this, this area that is described here is all to the north. And it even says, <laughs> it's a great land in the north, but it is cold. Now, you know that this has to be applying to people who we refer to as white people. It must be. That's where they come from. Before they uh, took over the lands of others, which means that they took over the land of J of Japheth took over the lands of, of Shem that rightfully belonged to Shem, and he took over lands that rightfully belonged to Ham, uh, because his inheritance is to the north, where it's cold. And you know we dark skinned people, we don't, you know, we don't like all that cold weather. You know, we're tropical Negroes. We want some heat. All right. And then what does it say in verse in verse 30? He says, five great islands. Five great islands. Go back to in your mind to Genesis chapter 10. Did it not say, and by these were the isles, islands of the Gentiles? And a great land in the north, but it is cold. And the land of Ham is hot. And the land of Shem is neither hot nor cold, but is a, but is uh, of a blend of cold and heat. Praise Yah. Yah's word is so wonderful. <laughs> Let's go on. So at this stage, we have the earth being divided amongst the children of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is given what is called the Middle Earth. Middle Earth. I would suspect that this is where these uh, people from Japheth's side uh, decided to call that area Middle East, I suspect. But going on, we have Shem taking what is called Middle Earth. That's his inheritance. And Ham gets the southern portion of the earth, the south. And Japheth is given the north. Japheth, Japheth is given the north where it is cold. Shem is given the Middle Earth where it is neither cold nor hot. Ham is given the the southern portion of earth where it is hot. This is their inheritance after the flood. This is how the land of earth was divided amongst mankind at that time. Now we're going to look into something that I think that eludes people quite often. We're going to turn to Genesis chapter 10 and take a look at verses 21 through 25. We're going to see something very interesting uh, regarding this division of the earth. I mean, the Bible corro uh, corroborates this. When we look at uh, verse 21, we see, Unto Shem, also the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even to him were born children. The children of Shem were Elam, Ashur, Arphazad, Lud, Aram, and the children of Aram were Lud, Hul, Gether, and Mosh. And Arphazad begot Salah, and Salah begot Eber. And unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days was the earth divided. In the days of Peleg was the earth divided. Now some would have suggested this was the tectonic plates of earth shifting and splitting 
and uh, that's when this occurred during the time of Peleg. No, this is not true. That's not what saying was being said here. This is when they divided the earth amongst the, themselves by lot. Japheth getting the cold north, Ham getting the hot south, and Shem getting the middle earth, the middle earth. Look where all the uh, antagonism is going on today. Is it not in the so-called Middle East where these people who claim to be uh, Jews and Hebrew Israelites? Uh, no, excuse me. They don't call themselves Israelites, do they? They call themselves Israelis. They don't call themselves Israelites. They say that they are Israelis. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 10, verse 21 through 25, where it says that in the days of Peleg was the earth divided, and indeed it was divided. They divided it amongst themselves. The children of Noah divided the earth amongst themselves for their inheritance forever. Now here we're going to look into, um, this is going to lead us directly into this idea of the curse of Ham which we have shown Ham was not cursed. Ham was never cursed. Ham's son, Canaan, was cursed. And we're going to see correctly why he was cursed. And it had nothing to do that he was having sex with his mother. He was having sex with his father, Noah. Now, this is just the nonsense of this and filthy wickedness of these racists that uh, are always besmearing the, the, uh, the character and the picture of dark-skinned people, both Ham and Shem. So while we're on this word Shem, let's take a look at something that's very interesting. Look at this word Shem, S-H-E-M. From the word Shem is derived the word Shemitic, Shemitic. Not Semitic, but Shemitic. Semitic, as in semi, means partially, not fully. The false Ashkenazi Jews of Japheth would say that this is an anti-Semitic statement. Anti-Semitic. Semitic, semi, meaning partially. Not fully. They're telling on themselves, aren't they? Let's take it through let's take a look at the, the person Eber. Eber, he said in verse twenty two it said that an Arphazad, I'm sorry, verse twenty four, and Arphazad begot Salah and Salah begot Eber. Well this word Eber is the word from which we get the word Heber H E B E R or Hebrew, H-E-B-I-R, from which is derived the word Hebrew. Hebrew. Eber is the word from which we get the word Hebrew. So if a person is Hebrew, it would be necessary for them to have passed through the lineage of Eber, who was one of the descendants of Shem, not Japheth. Not Japheth. Now let's take a look at this curse. Let's take a look at this curse problem. When we take a look at Jubilees 9 and 14, we read this. Jubilees 9 and 14. Again, one of those scriptures that Japheth uh, decided that he wasn't going to put into his version of uh, the scriptures, the Bible, but this is our scripture, it's not his. It's not for him to decide what gets included and what does not. So when we take a look at Jubilees chapter 9, verse 14, we see, And thus the sons of Noah divided unto their sons in the presence of Noah, their father, and he bound them all by an oath, imprecating a curse on everyone, that sought to seize the portion which had not befallen to him by his lot. 
And they all said, so be it, so be it for themselves and their sons forever throughout their generations till the day of judgment on which the Lord God, Yah, shall judge them with a sword and with fire for all the unclean wickedness of their errors, wherewith they have filled the earth with transgression and uncleanliness and fornication and sin. So we see here is where the curse came, the curse originated. They took an oath that they would not try to claim the land that belonged to the other. If they did, if they tried to seize the land, it said that they would be what? Cursed. There'd be a curse upon that son. Now, let's see. What do you think? What do you think that happens next? You should be able to figure this out now. Think they didn't teach it to us properly. They didn't teach it properly. The curse had nothing to do with uh, Ham having sex with dad and having sex with mom and all that kind of filth that they talk about. It was because a, a, a uh, pledge, an oath was taken that they would not seek to take, steal, the land that was uh, given to their brother. Now we've seen how the curse came into being, which was as a result of promising not to try to steal the land uh, of each other. But how did the curse fall upon Canaan. Let's take a look and see how that came, how that curse fell upon Canaan. We're in the book of Jubilees, chapter 10, verse 28 through 36, where we read, And Ham and his sons went into the land which he was to occupy, which he acquired as his portion of the land of the south. And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt that it was very good. And he went not into the land of his inheritance to the west, to the sea. He dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward from the border of Jordan and from the border of the sea. And Ham, his father, and Cush, and Mizraim, his brothers said unto him, Thou hast settled in a land which is not thine, and which did not fall to us by lot. Do not do this, do not do so, for if thou doest do so, thou and thy sons will fall in the land and be cursed through sedition, for by sedition ye have settled, and by sedition will thy sons fall and thou shalt be rooted out forever. Dwell not in the land of Shem, for to Shem and to his sons did it come by their lot. Cursed art thou, and cursed shalt thou be beyond all the sons of Noah, by the curse by which we bound ourselves, by an oath in the presence of the holy judge, and in the presence of Noah, our father. But he did not hearken unto them and dwelt in the land of Lebanon from Hamath to the entering of Egypt, he and his sons until this day. And for this reason, that land is named Canaan. And Japheth and his sons went forward went towards the sea and dwelt in the land of their portion. And Madai saw the land of the sea, and it did not please him. And he begged a portion from Ham and Asher and Arphazad, his wife's brother. And he dwelt in the land of Medea, near to his wife's brother until this day. And he dwelt I'm sorry, and he called his dwelling place and the dwelling place of his sons Medea 
after the name of their father, Madai. So here we have absolute proof of why Canaan was cursed. He was cursed because he broke his pledge not to try to obtain the land that fell to either of his other brothers. But notice that Canaan wasn't the only one. Canaan was not the only one. In verse 35, we see, it says, And Japheth and his sons went toward the sea and dwelt in the land of their portion, and Madai, remember, if you, if you don't remember, look back and see, you'll see that Madai was a descendant of Japheth. He was one of the children of uh, Japheth, as I recall. And Japheth and his son went towards the sea and dwelt in the land of their portion. And Madai saw the land of the sea and did, and it did not please him. Madai didn't like the, his portion. He didn't like his portion. So what did he do? He begged a portion from a uh, Ham, a Hamite, obviously, and Asher, who was a Shemitic. These are descendants of Shem and Arphazad. Again, a descendant of Shem. In fact, it says here that, he, that Arphazad was his, his wife's brother. So Madai was, uh, uh, wife was Shemitic. So we have this link between Japheth and Shemite through Arphazad's sister. And it said that he called the name of the land Medea. Medea, after his the name of his father, Madai. Okay, now we know. That's why Canaan was cursed. But a curse obviously is falling on uh, uh, the these Medes, these people called Medes, because what did they do? They took over some land in th that's supposed to go to Shem. And guess where that place is? Guess where we call that today? That land which the scriptures are referring to in verse 36, where they call that land Medea. Do you know where that's called today? It's called Iraq and Iran. Iraq and Iran. Now let's revisit a map that we had taken a look at previously. Look at where it says to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. You see the word Canaan? It's called Canaan or Canaan land. Why? Because Canaan was passing through this land and he said, I like this place. I like, I like this. I'm going to take this. And he settled down there. But that was land that was given unto Shem. That was land that was promised to Shem. That's why they call it the promised land. By lot, by drawing, Canaan was supposed to take the land to the south, further to the south, as what the other uh, descendants of Ham did. See where it says Ludim, Adonim, Lehabim, and all these other folks down there with in Cush and Put and Mizraim. This is where the descendants of Ham, they did what they were supposed to do. They went into their land to occupy their land. But it was Canaan who did not. He settled in the land of Shem. And by doing so, brought the curse upon himself and his descendants. The curse was not upon Ham and Ham's descendants. The curse was upon Canaan and his descendants. The Jebusites, Hittites, Amorites, Gergesites. Hivite and Dedan. Now, recall when 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 Moses uh, uh, took the Hebrew Israelites out of the land of Egypt, right, and into the wilderness. Then Joshua took over, and they went. They crossed the Jordan into Canaan land, and then they went to war with these people. These are these same people. Never mind what Hollywood says, because they're lying. Never mind what the educational system of Japheth is saying, because they're lying. These were dark-skinned, Hamitic people who were, who were at war with the dark-skinned, 
Shemitic people because the Shemites had been promised this land. That's why the, the, the scriptures refer to it as the promised land. Now look further to the east, to your right, as you're watching this, looking at this, just below the Caspian Sea, where it says Madai, or the Medes. Well, this land was also given unto Shem. But we just read in scriptures where there were Japheth, uh, son Madai, went into his area that was given to him, and he didn't like it. He didn't like being there. He went there, the land to the north by the sea that was given unto uh, Japheth and his descendants, but Madai didn't like it. He said, I don't like this. And what did he do? He went into the land of Shem and he took and occupied the land. That became known as Medes. Now recall from scriptures that in the Babylonian uh, uh, captivity that it was the media, the Medes, media Persia that took the uh, that, that took the Hebrew Israelites from the Babylonians and then later they would release them but they're in the area today where we would call Iraq and Iran and other places but they weren't supposed to be there either they were supposed to be further north so it wasn't only Canaan who uh, invoked a curse upon them because he claimed the land of Shem, but the, some of the descendants of Japheth, some of the descendants of Japheth. Where do we see all this turmoil going on in the world today? Where do we see some of them people who look uh, very, very much like like uh, the descendants of Japheth, don't they? Facial structure, nose structure, hair, these things, they look a lot like Japheth because they're descendants of Japheth. A mixture, no doubt. People have been mixturing for quite some time, but that's still the descendants of Japheth. They're there. They're there to this day, and all hell is breaking loose in that area today. And one of the reasons is because their behinds are under the curse. Canaan was cursed, not Ham. Now let's take a look at some of the artifacts left by the descendants of Ham. Make no doubt about it, these were a very, very great people, a very, very intelligent people, despite what Japheth would have us to believe. You know, he'd tell us that we were swinging through trees and eating each other while he claims he steal the land of Ham. And he claims still the land of Shem. They've been telling a lie for a very, very long time. But Hebrew delight people are most surely waking, awakening and we're throwing off that yoke of the bondage. All right, so we're going to go through some of these pictures fairly quickly and wrap this lesson up. And I will see you at the conclusion.
The descendants of Ham compared to those of Shem are very similar. Biblically, there was a great deal of interaction between the lineages of Ham and Shem. Abraham and Hagar, followed by Keturah, is but two well-known examples of this Hamitic, Shemitic intermixing. As Zondervan's Bible Dictionary suggests that both were progenitors of dark-skinned races, but Ham was the progenitor of the so-called Africans, while Shem was the progenitor of the so-called Negro, who were labeled such by the enslaving 13th century European, uh, Portuguese, and Spanish descendants of Japheth. Ham being the father of Mizraim, who was the progenitor of those that populated and brought to mankind what is probably the best known civilization of the world, the Egyptians, as the Greeks called them, who were dark-skinned people that we today would call to we would call black. It was under these great people that the other dark-skinned branch of humanity lived and were enslaved for 430 years. It is among these people that the angel told Yosef, Joseph, to take the Messiah child, Yahusha, aka Jesus, and his mother, Miriam, aka Mary, I told you they always change the names, uh, to flee the murderous intent of King Herod, who sought to kill him. Why into Egypt? Because they could blend in with the other dark-skinned people and find safety there. The Hamitic curse is a lie. Ham was never cursed. His son Canaan was cursed, not because he stumbled upon his drunken and naked father, but because he swore an oath along with his brothers never to try to claim land that did not fall to them by lot. Canaan broke this oath and seized part of the land belonging to Shem. This land was called Canaan land by the Canaanites. But the land scripture calls the promised land because it was promised to Shem. Canaan was not the only one that broke the oath. The children of Japheth would also break the oath as Madai would later seize land from Shem in the east, which became known as Media Persia, then Persia, today called Iraq and Iran. So here we are at the end of another Hebrew Israelite home Bible study group lesson. Today focusing on Ham and his descendants. Ham, that second, the middle son of Noah. Ham, whose son Canaan was cursed. Canaan, not Ham, Canaan. So we thank Holy Yah for giving us this time and giving us this opportunity to share this information from His Holy Scripture with all who would listen and pay attention and absorb this wonderful information from Holy Yah. So we thank you again from the Hebrew Israelite Home Bible Study Group here in Pensacola, Florida. I say Shalom. And to those of us who keep the Sabbath according to the biblical lunar solar calendar, I say Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, brothers and sisters.